Good morning, church. I, uh, I'm glad to be here with you opening God's Word uh, today. If we haven't had an opportunity to meet, like uh, Mackenzie said, my name is Jesse Bell. I'm our student pastor here at Connection Church. Uh, if you have your Bible, if you want to get it out and get it open, we're going to be in John chapter 17 today. Uh, and that's the one of the four gospel accounts in your New Testament. It's the fourth book in your New Testament. Uh, and so if you want to, like I said, get that out and get to John uh, chapter 17, that's where we're going to be spending our time uh, in the last portion of this passage in a message that I have titled, uh, The Answer to a Prayer. Uh, and so while you're getting to John 17, I've got a couple questions for you that hopefully pretty well everyone in the room is going to be able to answer positively one or the other. Uh, the first question is, are you a mother? Uh, and if you're a mother, uh, do you often pray for your kids? Uh, I assume the answer for most of you who are mothers is yes, right? I know that that tends to be the case for most mothers, is that, that you pray for your kids quite often. The second question I have, uh, again, should apply to everyone in the room, uh, and that is, do you know that somebody in your life whether it's your mama or your grandmother or somebody else, do you know that somebody is regularly praying for you? Uh, if you're like me, you know that your mother does pray for you regularly because she tells you that, right? I have no doubt whether my mother prays for me or not because quite often she reminds me that she is. A good example of this is just a few weeks back, Gabe hurt his arm. Uh, no worries, he's totally fine. But we had to take him to the doctor, and uh, after we took him, I called my mom and told her uh, that what had happened, and, and, and we were on the way home. And a few days later, when I talked to her, her one of her first questions was, how's Gabe? Of course, right? Uh, and I told her, gave her the report, how Gabe was doing, he was totally fine. Uh, and to which she said, good, I've been praying for him. Uh, and, and I didn't say this, but I was like, yeah, I know. I know you had, mom. Uh, because that's what you do. I have no doubt whether my mom had been praying for Gabe or not. Uh, because that's just what she does, right? That's her character to pray for her kids and for her grandkids. Uh, and, and so I guarantee you that each and every one of us in the room, uh, whether you're consciously aware of somebody doing it or not, somebody's praying for you, and it's possibly your mama, uh, right? Because like I said, that's pretty common. Uh, and part of that, if you know that somebody's praying for you, uh, it, it makes you want to be better. It makes you want to do better. Right? If, if, if my mom is praying for me in a, in a certain way, and I know that she is, it, it makes me want to perform. Right? It makes me want to uh, be the answer to her prayer. And today in John chapter 17, uh, what we're going to see is a beautiful truth. The truth that Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, like Jesus, God, prayed for you and he prayed for me. Jesus prayed for us. I don't know if you knew that or not. Like, like in the Bible, Jesus specifically prayed for us. And, and again, today we are going to see that. We're going to see Jesus' prayer for us. Uh, this prayer that Jesus offered is commonly referred to as the high priestly prayer. You may have heard that before. Uh, I also learned that a lot of times people call this the Lord's prayer uh, because the Lord himself is praying, right? Uh, but in the Old Testament, a clear picture is painted and, and, and we see that it is true in the New Testament that Jesus is our high priest, right? Jesus is our high priest. And that's why it's called the high priestly prayer, because Jesus is fulfilling his duty as the high priest, praying for and on behalf of his people, petitioning God on behalf of us, on behalf of his children. Uh, it's incredible to know that in his last days on earth, Jesus prayed for us. Right? This is just before Judas betrayed Jesus. This is just before Jesus went to die on the cross. Die on the cross for your sin and for my sin. Uh, and, and, and while the weight of the world's sin was being placed on Jesus' shoulders, he was thinking of you. He was thinking of me. We were on his mind. Our unity was on his mind. And as this prayer makes very clear, uh, one of Jesus' greatest concerns in his final moments on earth was for you and I to be one, for us to be unified with a common goal and a common purpose. Uh, and so what we're going to see in this prayer today is that Jesus' prayer, it drives us to be unified in Christ so that the world may know the love of God and that we may experience his glory. That's what we're going to see in this passage today. So let's jump in. Let's read uh, John chapter 17. We're going to read verses 20 through 26. 
This is Jesus' prayer. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me, before the foundations of the world. Verse 25. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So again, this, title, this sermon, as I told you, the title is the answer to a prayer, right? What I want you to see when we leave here today is that we can be an answer to this prayer of Jesus. And the first way that we can answer this prayer of Jesus is we can answer the prayer by being unified. It's a huge theme in this passage. Jesus desires that you and I be unified. He greatly longs for a church that comes together in unity, for a church that does the work that he has set before us. However, this is not the world that we see today, right? Like, you know that, I know that. We live in this world. It's not the, it's not the, the church that we see, right? In the church today, we don't see, I'm not saying our church, but the church, capital C church, like there's not a lot of unity uh, across the board. But Jesus, his desire is that we would be unified. He is calling for us to be unifi unified for the purpose of making him known. If we're going to understand what it means to be unified, I think we have to ask this question first. What is it that divides us? If we're going to be unified for the purpose of making Jesus known, making the Lord known to the nations, what divides us? What, what, what comes between us uh, that keeps us from being one? Now, there's some trivial things, right? These are the things that, 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 that typically aren't too big of a deal. Uh, like whether we agree on our favorite football team or our favorite basketball team, like those may divide us. We, we may get divided on who's the greatest quarterback of all time or who's the greatest basketball player of all time, right? You, may, may, you and I may not agree on how to spend a Saturday. I may want to go play golf. You may want to spend the Saturday in your garage working on your car, right? Like these things, these things are, are things that divide us, but these are just trivial things. And, and the one thing, though, that we have to understand, even though these are trivial, a lot of times they can lead to disunity, and they can lead to disunity when we take them too far, right? Nobody in here, please mention Bedlam, right? <laughs> some of you take it way too far. Uh, some people take it way too far, and, and that causes division. But again, these are, are, are trivial things, things that, that, that yeah, they, they can lead to disunity, but, but let's just understand that we have to lay our own opinions aside right, and seek unity, especially on these small things. We have to, to, to lay our, our own opinion aside and just seek the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ. But, but there are real issues that divide us today. Again, I want to look at what divides us. As a nation, as a state, as a city, as a town here in Elgin, like as a church, what comes between us? What makes you and me different? What makes you and the person across the aisle different? Some of the biggest issues that we see today are our political issues, right? Some, some of us, we spend so much time worrying about whether we're on the right side of the aisle or the left, and then whether the person we're talking to is on the right side of the aisle or the left, and, and, and we forget that, that we're all human, right? We're all image bearers of Christ. Like, yeah, there's things, that, ideological differences that make us uh, see things differently, but, but sometimes we forget, like, that person that we're arguing with, like, they bear the image of Christ, the image of God, just as much as we do. So we can't let these things be things that divide us. Another serious issue in our nation today 
like a, a really, really big issue is the issue of race, right? People thinking that they're superior because of where they were born or what color their skin is. And there's no room for those issues in the unity of the church. Like we have to lay those things aside uh, because we, we can't function together if we're letting things like that separate us. It, it, it calls to mind 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The Apostle Paul says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. It doesn't matter what differences you have. It doesn't matter Jew or Greek or whatever other uh, issues can divide us. Like we are all part of the same body of Christ if we have trusted in him. And we all drink of the same spirit, right? We are all filled with the same spirit. And we have to remember that. We have to understand that. Another common dividing issue that I think we see uh, anywhere in the world, here in, in our city and, and all over the nation, is economic barriers, right? You and I may have very different incomes. You and I may live in very different homes. We may live in very different neighborhoods. And, and often in our society, those issues divide us so much. Like we don't want anything to do with either the person that's too rich and snobby or either the person that's too low and, and, and not good enough, right? These issues, they divide us. But if anything, as followers of Christ, these things, like they should bring us together because uh, we should close the gap of division, especially when we're talking about an economic barrier. But we should close that gap through generosity. Like we should, we as Christians, like there should be no gaps when we talk about uh, economic differences and, and racial differences and whatever else because again like like if we're living as Christ called us to live like we should be drawn together not pushed apart one last dividing line and, and Abby and I were talking yesterday through this and, and this is this is something that she thought of I thought it's great and, and I think we don't see it as much in our church but as a society again as the church I think this is a huge issue uh, and it's the generational divide right how many times do you hear things like, oh, kids these days, or, well, he is a millennial, right? That's why he's acting the way he is. Like, or, or even younger people who, who maybe look at older people like, do you seriously not know how to open that app on your phone? Like, tap it, right? Like, like there, there's, there's these differences in generations that, that divide our, our society. Again, I don't think we see as much of it in our church, but the church, like, it's, it's a big issue. And, and, and I promise there's value, though, in... In, in understanding other generations and understanding the way other people see things, right? Like I can learn from the experience of those older than me and I can teach my experience of those younger than me. And that's true for all of us in the room. And so again, I say all this to, to all these examples to, to say this, this one thing, like we must work as a church to answer Jesus's prayer by being unified. We must work to get away from these dividing lines and work towards unity. In, in verse 20, uh, Jesus tells us that uh, we are, are, are given this, like this, this word that we have, like the, the, the text tells us that this calling from Jesus is promoted to us by the words of the apostles. It says that, uh, I do not ask for these only, these only that he's talking about earlier in this high priestly prayer, Jesus is praying for his disciples. And it says that I do not ask only for these, but uh, for those who will believe through their word. And we will see, like, that, like in this text, we see that we come to faith through others, uh, the other testimony of those apostles. We know Jesus by their testimony. And, and, and why, why did Jesus tell us that? That's the question. Like, it kind of seems out of place, like, to tell us that, that, that he's praying for people who will believe because of their words. And the reason that he does that is if we look at the apostles— and we look at the early church, like Jesus's testimony is given to us out of a unified church. Like it worked, right? The apostles were very unified. The apostles, they didn't care about the divisions, that, that some were richer than other or poorer than other, or maybe one was a Jew or one was a Gentile. Like they didn't, the early church didn't care. Like they worked together. And the unity of this church thousands of years ago, it played a role in, in any of us in the room today that trust in Christ. The unity of their church Played a role in you coming to faith in Christ today. This unity that is promoted by the Bible, this <laughs> unity that is prayed by Jesus, like it has to be an observable unity. It has to be something that we can see in the church. It, it's adhering to the gospel that we were given by these apostles. It's the joy and it's the love and it's the self-sacrifice that is committed to fulfilling the, the mission that they have given us, right? 
the great commission that we have to go and to make disciples and to baptize people. Like, like this, is, this is a commission that was given to us from a unified church. <coughs> and we have to be unified together today to fulfill this mission that Jesus has given us. The worldly things in this world that tear us apart, man, they do divide us. Like all of those examples that I gave you, and so many more that are popping into your head, the things that make you different than the person next to you, or the person across the aisle, or the person that you work with, uh, or the person that you go to school with, or whatever else. Like the differences that you have with those people, they tear us apart. And there, but there is nothing that can, that can unify us like the gospel, like the words of Jesus, like the truth given to us from God. Again, there is nothing that can unify us like the gospel. I've had, I've had this conversation with our uh, youth for, for weeks in a row. Maybe the last three or four weeks we've mentioned this same thing. This idea that the gospel, it's, it's a gospel that has, that has two different horizons, if you will. It's a vertical gospel, right? When you trust the gospel, you grow in a relationship with Jesus, with Christ. Like you grow vertically, like you grow closer to the Lord. But there's a second horizon to the gospel that's important when we consider our unity and being together as one in Christ. The gospel also has a horizontal horizon. Like the gospel draws us near to each other. The gospel draws us together. And when we understand the gospel and we truly live out the gospel, unity will be promoted among us. The gospel, it should lead us away from worldly things that divide us. And it should lead us to Jesus. It should lead us to one another. When we trust the story that these apostles have given us in this book... And we will become a unified church. We will become a unified people who live out the purpose of the church, who live out the purpose of Christ. The world is not what we are called to, right? The scripture tells us that we are aliens. We are foreigners in this land. But we have to be aliens that are unified, foreigners that are unified, that, that, that come together and promote godliness among the nations and show others the love of Christ. In verse 22, there's something that it just doesn't really seem to fit with this theme of unity. Jesus tells us that he will give us his glory. And the question is, again, how does that fit in? Like, like we're talking about unity, we're talking about making Jesus known, and Jesus says, I will give you my glory. What does it mean? Well, well the Holy Spirit, like when we, when we trust in Christ, when we give Jesus our life, right? The Holy Spirit comes into us and he convicts us of sin and Jesus reveals to us the glory of the Father. And, and what happens in that moment when we get the Holy Spirit and, and as we live our lives and the Holy Spirit convicts us is our mind begins to change. When we get that glory of God within us in the Holy Spirit, our mind is transformed to better understand what's right and what is wrong. And it moves us to be more like God. And so to say that Jesus is giving us his glory, it's telling us that, that we begin to agree with God. We begin to understand what's right and what's wrong. We begin to lean on him and not on the world. This type of unity, it tells us this, it's the same unity uh, that, that the Father has with the Son. And it's offered to us as believers that we can be unified in the same way that, that the Father and the Son are unified as one. And, and, and we have the same goal, right? The goal is to go and make Jesus known to the world. In these first four verses that we're looking at, in the beginning of this prayer, in just, just four verses, four different times Jesus mentions that he is, he's praying to God that he wants us to be one. And twice he prays that, he, that that would lead us to make him known. In just four verses, this is a very easy to pick out theme. That Jesus wants us unified for the purpose of making him known. It's clearly important to him. And when we do it, the text tells us that we will receive and experience the same love that the Father has for the Son. That is an incredible thought. That, that when we live out this prayer, when we answer this prayer that Jesus prayed, when we are unified, and when we make the Lord known, like we get to experience the love that the Father has reserved for the Son. We get to live in the fullness of the love of God just as Jesus did. When we experience this love that Jesus is offering in, in unity with him and in unity with the church, we cannot help but to be transformed, to be made different, to be made new. And when we are transformed by his word, the world will notice. And, and that's what Jesus is getting at. He says, if you will be unified 
and, and, and let your mind be changed by my glory, then the world's going to see that, and the world's going to see that you're different, and the church is different, and the world's going to desire to be part of the church. But to live in unity, again, we must be transformed. It is what Jesus desires. It's the next thing we see in the text. Clearly, in this next portion of prayer, we see the next answer uh, to prayer that we ought to be. The second answer to prayer is that we can answer the prayer of Jesus. We can answer the prayer by walking with Jesus. We can answer this high priestly prayer that Jesus offered to the Father by walking with him. In verse 24, Jesus is praying that we would be saved. He's praying that you would be saved. He's praying that, that all of those who would hear the testimony of the disciples, read that all of those that would, would hear truth from this book would be saved. Jesus desires that, that we would come into a relationship with him. This prayer comes directly after Jesus prays that we would share the love of God because he knows what the result of us sharing the love of God would be. I love the way uh, a great theologian and, and a writer of one of the most uh, popular and well-known commentaries on the book of John, his name is D.A. Carson. Uh, he, speaking of this prayer, said that this prayer, like Jesus, Jesus prayed this prayer because he knew, this is what D.A. Carson said, he knew that those who share in the delights of being loved by the Father share also in the glory to which the Father is restored in consequence of his death and exaltation. So what he's saying, what D.A. Carson is saying, is that those of us who share in God's love will also share in Jesus' reward, and that is the desire that Jesus has for us. You see, one of, the main, one of the main goals of you being transformed by the love of Jesus, one of the main goals of our salvation is to be glorified. Salvation leads to glorification. And, and, and that's to say that one of the main goals of living with Christ is, is, is accepting the gospel and repenting of our sins and then being glorified, being made more like Christ. See, one day, each and every one of us uh, that have trusted in Christ, like we will be in heaven, we will be glorified as a son or a daughter of the Father. Each and every one of us who have trusted in Jesus, like we are working towards a day when we will be in the presence of of God and, and, and Jesus again he's praying for that he's, he desires that we would all walk with him that we would all know him and, and in the Christ centered exposition commentary on John Matt Carter and Josh Wordberg wrote this they said in just a little while we will experience the uninhibited love of the Father and the Son the uninhibited love that they have shared from the foundations of the world but we can experience it here and that's why Jesus is praying this prayer. Uh, you see, he prays this prayer that we would be uh, with him, that we would walk with him because we can experience his love now. Not just in the glory of heaven, but like we can begin to understand what it's like to live in the glory of God now. He wants us to experience the love of God now. And a huge part of experiencing this love of God, a huge part of living in God's glory is being unified. That, that's this, this whole prayer is pushing us to be one uh, with God and one with each other. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples that he's going to prepare a place for them. Here in this prayer, Jesus is showing us that that place is being prepared for us too. Like we also get to experience what his disciples are going to get to experience. It is his desire that's the word that he uses here, right? Jesus says, it's my desire. Jesus desires that we would experience his love, experience his grace, experience his glory. And, and we experience that grace and that glory, again, by being unified, by being one, by setting aside our differences and, and, and showing others the love of God because the love of God is radiating through us and to them. Jesus ends this prayer by asking our righteous God, that we would be able to do that. In the last two verses of the prayer, I love the way he starts. He says, oh, righteous father. Jesus says, oh, righteous father. He is, he is he's admitting the glory of God. He is, he is going to God in, 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 in humility and in understanding who God is. And he gives us in these last two verses, uh, he gives us the last way that we can be an answer to this prayer. 
the last way that we can answer this prayer of God, he says that we ought to answer the prayer of God by showing God's love. So you can be an answer to this prayer by showing God's love. Jesus tells us that he knows the Father and that though the world doesn't know the Father, like Jesus is making the Father known. And, and yes, in, in, in the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke, all of these Gospel accounts of Jesus, we see Jesus' life playing out, right? We see the, the miracles that Jesus does. We see Jesus preaching. We see Jesus drawing others into him. But the question becomes, like, if, if Jesus is no longer here, but Jesus is praying that he be made known, like, how is Jesus to be made known today, right? How does Jesus make the Father known today? Jesus makes the Father known today through you and me. And he's praying here that we would be the conduit, right? That we would be the ones that get the Father's love from God to others. And that's our call here as the church today. That's how he began the prayer, right? One of the greatest purposes riddled throughout is that he would make, that we would make him known to the world. Over and over in the first, he says in verse 21, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Uh, he says it multiple times through this prayer, that we would make Jesus known, that we would make God known. And again, in the final part of this prayer, uh, he's praying that he, that we would continue Jesus' work here on earth. That all of the incredible things that Jesus did, we would continue to do. In, in the book of John earlier, he tells us that we will do greater things than him, right? When he leaves, like, like we look at all the amazing things that Jesus did, all the amazing miracles. He tells us that we today, followers of Christ in 2023, years and years and years after he walked on this earth, that we will do his work and that our work here on his behalf will be greater than what he did when he was here. And so he's praying to God, God, give them the strength, give them the ability, push them to be your love. Push them to be my love. That's what Jesus is saying. His work continues through you and it continues through me. He continues so that Jesus doesn't just become some mere character of history, right? Like we speak the name of Jesus today because he is God and he has given us the power to do that. The name of Jesus is known because like, this prayer has been answered and we have to continue to answer it, that we have made the love of God known. I remember uh, years back, I heard a sermon uh, from a guy named Jonathan Bakluda, and he's talking about, it was, a, it was more of an apologetic style sermon, right? And he's, he's trying to convince people that Jesus is real, like this really happened. And, and something that's always stuck out to me is, is he, in the sermon, he talked about how he asked a guy one time, asked a, uh, an atheist, like, do you believe in God? He's like, no. He's like, well, then when you sign your check, why do you put the date that you put? Right? Like, we all, like, every day, in some way or another, we admit, like, some guy lived a couple thousand years ago, and we admit that something really big happened when he was here. Right? It, it, it changed the foundations of the earth, and you and I get the opportunity today to be the ones to tell others about that. And the only way that works is when we come together as a unified church, a church that continues and, and, and takes every opportunity we can to make Jesus known. The work of Jesus has continued today so that we can all be a part of his kingdom today and in eternity. Right? In these final verses, we see it. Like Jesus desires that we would move past the experience that we have with God today that's tainted with sinfulness and move towards an experience that's more like what Jesus had with God. Because church, today, when, when we don't live in God's love, when we don't live in the way that God calls us to live, it means we're living in sin. And when we live in sin, like, we separate ourselves from God. God never separates himself from us, but, like, as we live in the way that our hearts desire, in the way that our bodies desire, in the way that pleases our flesh, like, when we live in those ways, we pull away from God. But Jesus, like, he's telling us here, he's like, God, please, like, like, draw them in and make them make me known. Like, draw them in and, and make them make the love of God known. Why? Because, like, Jesus, like, he doesn't want us to experience, like, a watered-down version of what it means to be in God's presence. 
He doesn't want us to just experience the presence of God on a Sunday morning and then maybe a Bible study later sometime in the week. Like he wants us to experience the presence and the fullness of God's glory every single day in, in all moments, like all the time. And the way we do that is by us doing it, right? By us being the church, by us being unified as the church, by us like knowing the love of God and showing the love of God. If we want to experience the love in the way that, that Jesus prays for us to experience it, then we have to live in God's love all the time. Jesus wants us to turn from the world and, and be unified and, and experience his glory fully. He wants us to move towards seeing the Father's glory in, in the same way that he sees the Father's glory. He wants us to experience Unity with the Lord the way that he did. And we do that by experiencing unity with one another because we are all the body of Christ. And when we come together as the body of Christ, like we become more like Christ. And then we experience life and we experience uh, a relationship with God more like Christ did. Because again, we are becoming more like Christ by becoming more of the body of Christ. And so this just works when we're all together. Speaking of this passage, one of my favorite pastors of all time to listen to. I love to listen to John Piper. He is so good. Uh, and, and speaking of this passage in his book called Providence, John Piper said, Jesus prays that we would not only see his glory and not only be changed by his glory in general, but also that we would love his glory, delight in it, take pleasure in it with the delight and pleasure that God has given the beauty of his son. I couldn't say that any better myself. Like Jesus, it's not that Jesus just wants us to take part in his glory, not that he just wants us to be changed by the glory of God. Like in this prayer, Jesus is crying out to the Father, Lord, would you let them delight in your glory? Would you let them take pleasure, like delight in the fact that we get to be a part of God's glory? Right? Like we must experience, like we, if we as Christians today, live this life the way that we're called to live it, like unified together, then, then we get to answer this prayer and, and, and what Jesus is praying for is that we would delight in God, that we would delight in his love, that, that everything we do, we would find joy in the love of the Father. And again, if we just live the way that Jesus is calling us to, unified together and focused on his love, then we get to answer a part of this prayer. Showing God's love is answering this prayer. It makes us answer the first part of the prayer when we show his love, again, because we become unified. When we show God's love, we're united together, and we will make him known. We will lead others to walk with him, and we get to bask in his love and his glory. As we think of the importance of being unified and working to walk with Jesus and working to live in God's glory, uh, just as we are called in this prayer, I think there's a question that we have to ask. It's like, does it work? Like, if I work to be the answer to Jesus' prayer, if I work to be unified, if I work to walk with Jesus, if I work to live in God's love, like, is it actually going to help? Is it going to do anything that's useful for me today? Like, does this prayer work? Like, does this prayer that Jesus prayed to God, if I live in that prayer, if I answer that prayer with the way that I live my life, is it going to change anything? Is, is, is being unified and living in God's glory really going to accomplish anything? Is it going to affect my life? And what I've learned as I've studied the Bible and, and as I've studied uh, the Old Testament, and the New, and, and, as you just dive into the Bible, one of, almost always one of the best places to go and see if a truth in the Bible works is, is the Bible. right? If we want to see if, if what is being taught by Jesus really works, Let's let the Bible interpret the Bible. And, and so in, in the book of Acts, like there's, there's a beautiful story that's going to show us whether this is going to work or not. You don't have to go there, but I'm going to read a few verses out of the book of Acts. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, uh, it says, But many of those who had heard these words believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And so uh, right before this, a sermon is preached by Peter, in Acts chapter 3, and because of that sermon was preached, and because uh, the unified church came together and preached the word, 5,000 people came to know Christ. Then, in the, at the end of chapter 4, 
after we learn about these 5,000 who came to know Christ. Luke, the author of Acts, he tells us this in chapter 4, verses 32, and 30, 32 through 34. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And the great power of the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. And so the question, like, does it work? Does being a unified church work? It sounds like it worked for the early church in the book of Acts, right? It sounds like it works for them because 5,000 people came to know the Lord in the first part of chapter 4 of the book of Acts. And in the last part, it tells us that the full number of those who believed, the full number of the 5,000 who believed, it says they were of one heart and of one soul. And then what happens? Like, right, they, they, they believed and they became unified, and obviously they are living in God's love. And it tells us that their, their testimony, uh, because of their great testimony, like a great grace was upon them, right? Nobody lived in need. Everybody had what they needed. Like, like the church functioned well, the church functioned right. Like these 5,000 people on top of all of those who were already part of the church. But the, I, I say 5,000 people, the scripture tells us 5,000 men. And so we have to assume at least 15,000 people because all those men had spouses and probably at least one child. Right? And so 15,000 people come together, and they become of one heart and of one soul. And when they did that, like, nobody was in need. The church worked. The prayer of Jesus worked. Right? Like, they did what they were called to. They became unified, and when they became unified, they lived in God's love, and they received God's grace. And church, what I wanted to tell you today is, like, this can be our story, too. We also today can live in the grace of of God, like we can profoundly care for one another. We can be the answer to Jesus's prayer, just as the church in Acts chapter four was the answer to Jesus's prayer. We just, like there, there's a simple way that we do it, right? We have to be unified. We have to come, we must set the things that separate us aside and we must come together. I wanna to tell you right now, like I know that it feels like it matters. It feels like it's so important like which political party wins, but it doesn't matter. In eternity, it doesn't matter. Jesus, like in the Bible, God tells us, like, like God in control of that. Every person sitting in any office is there because Jesus put them there, because God put them there. Like today, for the purpose of the church to be unified, it doesn't matter what's what political party we're a part of. It doesn't matter which football team won on Saturday. Like, those things in eternity, they seem like they matter today, but in eternity, like, they don't matter. We have to be, we have to set those things aside and be unified as a church. We have to become one. As the Father and the Son are one, we have to become one, and we can only do that when we set the things that, set, that, that pull us away from each other aside and come together for the common purpose of making God known and, and living in the glory of God. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. It doesn't matter what our opinions are. It doesn't matter. Like, what matters is, is whose you are. Not what you believe or what you think about whatever political issue or whatever race issue or whatever economic issue or whatever football team issue, like, whatever else. Like, those things, like, they, they fail in comparison to it mattering of whose you are. And, and if you're here today and you're a member of the body of Christ, like if you have trusted in Jesus for your salvation, like you are Jesus's, you are his, that's what matters. That's the only allegiance that matters when we talk about the unity of the church. And so like we have to work together today to be unified in the way that the scripture tells us so that the world may know of who Jesus is. We have to show the world that walking with Jesus will lead us to living in God's glory. When, when you show God's love, the world will see him through you. And so my question to those in the room today who know Christ, who love Christ, who have given their life to Jesus, is the church's purpose your purpose? When you wake up in the morning, whatever drives you, like is the church's purpose your purpose. Do you desire to see what happened in the early church in the book of Acts? 
15, at least 15,000 people coming together, being of one heart and one soul, and taking care of the needs of others, and, and, and truly living under the grace of God. Do you desire that that would happen today? Because you can't, we can do it. We can be an answer to this prayer of God. We simply have to promote unity and bask in God's glory. To be the answer to Jesus' prayer, we, followers of Christ, you and I, we have to make Jesus' purpose, we have to make the church's purpose, our purpose, the purpose of unity. And maybe you're here today, and, and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And our prayer as a church, like as a gathered body of believers in the Lord Jesus, our prayer is that you would see this unity here. That when you come here, you would feel loved and you would feel known. That when you come here, like we hear this all the time, people who come for the first time, we'll ask them afterwards, and how, what, what, what do you think? How do you go? And they almost always answer to their question, answer to that question is something along the lines of, man, I just it felt like home. Like, I came here and I clearly knew that you guys cared about me. And so if you're here and you don't know Jesus, like that's our prayer is that you would come here and you would experience the unity of the Lord. We want to be a people who live in the grace of God. We want you to see that and we're inviting you. Jesus is inviting you to be a part of it. And I'm not saying it's just a part of our church. Yes, we would love that. But like, I'm saying Jesus is inviting you to be a part of the church. The global church, the body of Christ, the body of believers, and he wants you to come and be in unity. Be in unity with us and set aside differences and just focus on the Lord. This call from Jesus to be unified with, with us, with other believers of Christ, uh, for you, those of you who haven't trusted in Jesus, this call to unity extends into eternity. Like it extends so much further than just here and now and feeling like of being a part of something and being living in the grace of God. Like it, it extends to eternity. And Jesus, like he's inviting you in. He's inviting you to come and be a part of that. This gift of eternal grace, eternal love is offered freely. And, and, and it's more than just an offering, right? It's Jesus's desire. Again, in John 17, 24, the passage we read today, Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see the glory that you have given me. Jesus desires that, that all of the children of God, all of the creation of the Lord would come to be where he is, to join him in glory. And so would you be willing to turn to him today? Like if you're here, would you be willing to answer the prayer of Jesus? All it requires is the humility to say that you can't get to God on your own. The humility to say, like, my sin has created such a chasm between me and God that I can't navigate it. And if you'll admit that and you'll confess that Jesus is God, that he died for your sins, and that he rose and is sitting at the right hand of the Father, like, if you would admit that, like, you can be brought into eternal life. You can receive the eternal unity as one with the Father that we have talked about here today. So if you're here and you're a member of the church, if you are a part of the body of Christ, and the question is, is, is your purpose, does it align with God's purpose? Is the church's purpose your purpose? And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, again, like you are being offered an extension, like, like you are being offered an invitation to come into eternity with Jesus. Would you answer his prayer? Would you trust in him with your life? And if, if you need to make that decision, I would love to talk to you. And Rich would love to talk to you. Find somebody who knows and follows Christ. And we would love to have that conversation with you today. I'm going to pray. And then Rich has got an announcement. And then you guys are free to go and love and serve the Lord after that.